preacher meal to open us in a word of prayer. Thank you. Please be seated. Good evening to all of you. How is everybody today? Tonight. Uh, great and wonderful. Well, the Lord has given us a wonderful victory during the camp last week. And praise God for that. Amen. We totally enjoyed the testimonies coming from our young people and also from the adults. And I really appreciate those who attended and those who sponsored the campers. And I'm excited again to have our next camping next year with, among our youths. But of course, I announced last Sunday we are going to organize a couples camp uh, in December. It's going to be a winter's camp. Okay, so it's going to be a time of bonding, uh, you know, a bonding of uh, the husbands and wives away from the children. Okay, for three, it's going to be three, uh, three day, three day kind of a couples retreat. So please pray for that. Okay, and another plan that we also have is to also have a two night retreat for our college and career. Amen. So uh, there's another suggestion that was made uh, during the meeting I had with the preachers and pastors in the camp, okay, because they uh, totally understand and realize the importance of, uh, of having a retreat alone with God in order to really uh, uh, take captives of the hearts of our young people. So these are, these are the, uh, uh, the plans that we have in the near future, you know, beginning in the end of this year and also the following year. Another plan that we are also uh, going to have beginning next year, I've introduced uh, to all the campers the Youth for the World uh, opportunity. Again, we are going to revive the Youth for the World, okay? Uh, we're not going to only be including the uh, IABC main youths, but uh, all young people coming from different congregations. We are still in the process of uh, determining uh, what country will be going, we will be going next year. Okay, so at least uh, we can have uh, uh, one year to prepare. Okay, yeah. again, Youth for the World is, uh, is a uh, short-term missionary program for young people in order to give them the opportunity to, uh, to uh, preach, to teach, and also to do some peer counseling in a third world country. And already we receive invitation uh, in Mexico, in Canada, and also in the Philippines, especially in Cambodia, and also in Vietnam. Okay, so uh, let's pray. And also another nation, actually in Korea. So we'll have to make a, make a termination, so, okay, what country will be, will be going, okay? And so please pray for all this, uh, uh, these plans uh, for, for next year. And uh, again, it's summertime, and let us not allow ourselves to go into summer slump. Normally, that's our problem during summertime. Uh, for some reason, people don't uh, go to ch church as regular as they, they should be, and people are not giving as, uh, as regular as they should be. Okay, we ought not to be on vacation from God, amen? You know, yes, it's okay to take a vacation, but we, also, we always need to abide and be faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, once again, uh, I'd like to welcome you and... Uh, and uh, uh, we also have uh, uh, Terry, Preacher Terry from Las Vegas, Nevada, is staying here with us for the summer. Okay, and so please pray for Terry. And also another announcement, uh, Lisa Darauk and her children are coming back to the Bay Area. Uh, she's been communicating with me, asking if she can be able to come back to the Bay Area because uh, uh, the treatment of Glorious, which will last for the next three, four months, will, will always occur here in California. In Southern California, it uh, it has been very difficult for them to uh, commute from Las Vegas to California to have that uh, monthly treatment, and so uh, she begged to stay here. Okay, so uh, if there's any uh, family there in, uh, who has another room in their house for accommodation, we would appreciate it if uh, you can open your home to accommodate the drug family. Otherwise. You know, uh, we have the new annex that uh, was fixed by our men. Okay, we're just, going, we're just going to develop that into another housing close to uh, the housing of our young men here uh, for this coming three months. Okay, so to accommodate the Dirag family. 
and so please pray for them, okay? And, uh, and because of that, uh, uh, they do not have any support. Uh, Pastor Chris is no longer pastoring the missions uh, Las Vegas, and so they'll be in need of our uh, assistance, okay? And it's such time they leave for the Philippines to join uh, uh, Preacher Chris in order to start a work in the Philippines. So please pray for the Daraog family. Okay, so a lot of things are, are happening, okay? And I know that God will continue to provide. Amen? Okay, and he is always faithful in providing. Okay, let's all stand please now as we sing our welcome song. And let's be excited, okay? And let's be glad that we are in the house of God to worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's, walk, let's sing our welcome song, Our God Reigns. Together. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, good news, announcing peace, our God reigns, our God reigns, our God reigns. Let's now go around and greet one warmly. Let's sing the second verse as we go back. When we like sheep, our shepherds came. Let's do it again. Okay, second verse. Let's go to the second verse, okay? He had no stately form. He had no majesty that we should be drawn to him he was and we took no account of him our God reigns 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 Thank you. Please be seated. Just another announcement. Uh, finally, I, I booked for uh, London. I'll be leaving on August 1st and be staying there until August 8th. I spoke to a preacher, Jimmy Kabotahe, and he's requesting some Bibles. Okay, King James Bible. Uh, I was told that King James Bible is difficult to find in England. So if you have... Uh, uh, Anything to contribute in order for us to buy some Bibles, okay? We would appreciate it so I can bring some to, to London. And at the same time, he's also asking for a tract, okay, many tracts. But, uh, you know, he, we, he wants our church name printed there, International Bible Baptist Church UK, and their address and phone number. So uh, he would like to print uh, our own tracts for IEBC England because he would like to advertise and promote our minister in England. So please pray for that, okay? And if you can be able to uh, provide some means, uh, some funds to be able to do this, uh, they would totally appreciate it. This is our newest work. The reason why I need to be there is because I need to uh, uh, organize that work into a mission congregation at the same time to uh, install a formerly a preacher Jimmy Kabotahe as the mission pastor of IBBC UK and praise God for that. And some good news also, uh, I, I received a call from both Dr. David Wood and also uh, Dr. Rudy Holland. Please pray, okay? These are just some plans they shared with me. The first thing is uh, Dr. David Wood 
has committed uh, to support our Evercare Foundation, uh, uh, helping uh, the needy through our ministry, church ministry, uh, that, of, that of course includes our uh, pastors and families in the mission field, so please pray. Uh, and uh, he, he asks if he can also uh, include orphanage as one of our projects that he, that they with the ministry is willing to support also financially. He said as much as $3,000 a month is willing to provide in order to support our Africa Foundation. So please, please pray for that. You know, somehow we are now uh, getting some uh, uh, contributions coming from people that I've not even asked from. They just came, okay? And uh, Dr. Rudy Holland also called me up, uh, uh, you know, uh, four days ago and he said, Pastor, I, would, I want to know, uh, w you know, your ministry more. And when I talked to him regarding our uh, over 87 congregations and new work in London, he got excited. And he said, Pastor, about the reason why I, I want to talk to you is because I would like to support your ministry, okay? And he said, you know, I'm... I'm hoping that our church can be able to provide uh, your church $1,000 a month in order to support our church planting ministry. And praise God for that. Amen. You know, these are our friends, my friends, are willing to support their ministry because they believe in what, we're, in what we are doing. If other people believe in what we are doing, then the more we ought to believe in what we are doing. Amen. We ought to support what we are doing. Okay, let us not, uh, let us always be excited about the opportunities God, God, God uh, give us. Okay, because uh, it, it's not only uh, opening a lot of the doors to other, other people, but to other leaders as well, even wanting to help our ministry. But of course, those funds are not in yet. It's just, uh, those are just promises. And let us pray that they will uh, stay true to their promises. Okay, so please pray for that. God bless you. Amen. Now it's time for us to call our first special member of the day, and that will be from Pastor Francis Alonga. Yeah. Amen. Good evening. Here is love that sets the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life for ransom shed for us his precious blood, who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise, he can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the flood gates of God's mercy flow the vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured in and from above and heaven's peace and perfect justice kiss the guilty world in love. Let me all thy love accepting, love thee ever all my days. Let me seek thy kingdom only, and my life be to thy praise. Thou alone shall be my glory, nothing in this world I see. 
Thou hast cleansed and sanctified me, though thyself has set me free. In thy truth thou dost direct me by the Spirit through thy word and thy grace my need is meeting as I trust in thee my Lord all thy fullness thou art pouring thy great love and power on me without measure full and boundless may I yield myself to thee thou alone shall be my glory nothing in this world I see Thou hast cleansed and sanctified me, though thyself has set me free. Amen. 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 Thank God for Pastor Francis and his willingness to sing for the glory of God. And now we're going to do stand for ask you please stand for our offertory. Ask the two ushers please come in front. Yeah. Preacher James, will you please pray for our offering? Let us bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord and Father, thank you, for Lord, for bringing us here tonight. Lord, pray that you may forgive us for our sins, that you may hear these prayers. And Lord, I pray that you may be with the service tonight, Lord, be with your speakers tonight, Lord, that we may uh, use the message. Present his heart, Lord, to use in our daily and our spiritual life, Lord. I pray that you may bless this offering, Lord, that we may use it uh, according to your will, Lord, and use it to further your ministry, Lord. And I just pray that you may bless those who are given, Lord. I just pray that you may even be with those who are maybe on the way here tonight for the service, Lord, that you can travel the mercies here. And Lord, again, may you just bless this service and bless your children here tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may give as we sing. standing as we go to our Bible pledge. Ready, begin. This is my Bible. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It tells me who I am, what I can become, and where I am going. It renews my mind, changes my heart, and refreshes my soul. It is my daily bread. 
By faith, I will believe its promises, obey its commandments, and honor its principles in my life. With the Bible as my guide, I will walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, uh, I would like uh, to know, I would like uh, those who uh, believe you've been called by God to preach and to be in uh, the ministry, would you please rise? Or you have a desire to preach, would you please rise? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, especially, come on. How about those of you? This is, remember, remember, uh, decisions is not only done one time, it's a regular proposition, okay? All right, there you go. Okay, praise God for that, okay? You need to constantly uh, decide because every day you make decisions. Because sometimes we think that uh, surrendering is only one time. Surrendering is every day, okay? It does, it, does not go, it does not go that when you surrender one time, you've surrendered. That's not true. A lot of people have surrendered one time until now they're not surrendered. Okay, so I think we need to understand that uh, surrendering to the Lord is constant. Okay, it is abiding in Christ. So I would like you to uh, remember that, okay? It's not a one-time proposition. It is a constant action on our part and constant commitment on your part. Thank you very much. Please be seated. The reason why I asked you to uh, rise uh, tonight is because we are going to resume our practical training program for our, pre uh, uh, for our preacher's training program on Wednesday beginning next week. Okay, we will begin with, of course, with uh, some instructional uh, presentation is coming uh, next week. So I suggest it's summertime, okay, uh, please be uh, on time and please uh, be present during Wednesdays because I'm going to be using Wednesday as a practical training program for all the preachers, okay, for you to be trained, okay, will be, which will begin uh, with instructions uh, the first month. And then afterwards, we will get into uh, the uh, uh, practical uh, teaching and preaching program in which those, who, those of you who have uh, recently uh, surrendered to the preaching ministry and you're new in this calling, okay, you'll be asked to preach on certain doctrines. You're going to be presenting a doctrinal teaching. Okay? Doctrinal teaching. So if you do not have yet your mentor, I would like you to consult with Pastor Julius so he can assign you a mentor to work with you. What is a doctrinal teaching? Okay, choose a doctrine that, that, uh, that we stand on, and I want you to prepare a lesson on that particular doctrine. Amen. And those of you who have been, uh, those of you who are, not, who are not new anymore, you've been here as a junior preacher and a senior preacher, I would like you to present a doctrinal message, doctrinal preaching. So I want you to preach based on doctrines. Okay, not, not just based on uh, Christian living, doctrines. When we talk about doctrines, I'm referring to uh, uh, doctrines of faith, like uh, the doctrine of salvation, doctrine of the virgin birth, doctrine of uh, the theology, doctrine of the deity of Christ, doctrine of the humanity of Christ, doctrine of uh, hell, and doctrine, doctrine of heaven. Okay, so we're going to make a schedule again for you to do that. We'll be having two <clears throat> one to teach and one to preach every Wednesday. Okay, but of course, it's going to be, <clears throat> it's going to be after a regular services. So, so uh, you, need to, uh, <clears throat> you need to expect to be here until 10 o'clock for that. Okay, but of course, if our people would like to remain, you know, to watch you do that, then they can certainly remain. So that means we will go back into a public critic. Criticism. That means we're going to publicly criticize you. I mean, uh, you know, not not uh, not destroy you, dist not destructively criticize you, but constructively criticize you in order for you to uh, to learn, in order for you to uh, do well. Amen? Amen. Okay. So please prepare for that. You do not need you do not need to wait. Okay. First come, first serve. If you're ready, if you have an idea on what to teach and what to preach on. I would like you to submit your topics to uh, 
uh, Pastor Julius is first come, first serve. So that means if one has already taken the doctrine of salvation, nobody else can take that. Okay, so I suggest all preachers except our pastoral staff are required. Okay, so you need to submit to Pastor Julius okay, and to Pastor Francis, to them, your topic. Okay, and then afterwards you have to submit the outline as well. That means if you're a new preacher, you need to, uh, you need to consult with your mentor. And of course, your mentors here will be Pastor Francis, Pastor Julius, so consult with them. And then they will be assi assigned another mentor to work with you in regards to your uh, preacher's training program. And you are responsible also to finish your preacher's training program, which is online. The practical uh, method, the practical training will be on Wednesday, but the, uh, but the, uh, the actual, uh, your, your regular lesson will be online. I'll be adding more lessons on that. Okay, based on the Ben of Monte Baptist College, all right? So, uh, is there any question? No question? If you don't have any question, that means you have understood what I said. Amen. Amen. Okay. The same thing, the same thing, the same thing. The organization, the preaching, and of course, you know, uh, uh, in, in teaching, you need, to, you need to show your objective. What is your objective in teaching that lesson? Okay, when you teach, I want you to state your objective. What is the purpose of that lesson? State your purpose. Because when you teach and you don't have a purpose, you don't have any direction. So state your purpose. And also state your, uh, your, your main conclusion, okay, main direction. So if you teach, uh, establish your purpose. Of course, with a message, establish your text. Okay, all the time. Okay, any more questions? Huh? Due date? As soon as possible. It's first come, first serve. Okay, that, means, that means if, if uh, you know, if, if uh, uh, one doctrine is taken, you cannot teach or preach on doctor, doctrine anymore. If you don't have any doctrine to teach, I will be assigning you a topic. Okay, so if you, if you come early and you choose your own topic, you know, it'll be... Uh, 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 it'll be a lot more favorable to you than me assigning you the topic. Would you rather that I uh, would you rather uh, that I assign you a topic, or would you want you to choose your own topic? It's first come, first serve. Okay, all right. Okay, so let's let's do that and submit your topics to Pastor Julius and Pastor Francis. So in light of that, okay, uh, uh, tonight I, I I would like to discuss with you the re the real. Reliability of the scriptures, because that's be, that will be our foundation. I believe all of us need to be totally convinced and totally persuaded about the Word of God. Are you totally persuaded about the Bible? Amen. Amen. So if you're totally persuaded about the Bible, okay, do you read your Bible? Amen. If you read your Bible, do you know your Bible? Amen. Okay, well, some of you can say Amen cannot say amen, okay? Because most of us are just reading the Bible just for the sake of reading it, but not for the sake of learning. You know, I just, I just want to read it because I want, that's the pastor wants me to read it, okay? You need to read for the sake of learning, amen? amen. And you need to learn for the sake of applying. Amen. Okay, if you're just learning, not uh, for application, that is, that's not learning, so that means if you, if you are interested and excited about the Word of God, you need to read the Word of God. If you read the Word of God, you need to study the Word of God. You need to learn the Word of God. If you learn the Word of God, you need to also apply the Word of God. If you are applying the Word of God, you also need to share the Word of God with your life. Not just with your words. Okay? With your example. And this is very important. Because even how much you try to state how reliable the Bible is, if the Bible is not real in your lives, then you are not stating with your life that the Bible is real and reliable. Okay, so if you believe that a Bible is reliable, okay, and it's true, then it must be true in your personal lives. Amen? Amen. Now, again, I want to challenge you that you uh, try to read a Bible through in one year. And when you read the Bible, take note. Always take note. Get a journal. And write something. 
based on what you read. Okay? That's how you study the Word of God. Because, you know, we forget all the time. And don't, don't tell me, well, I remember that. No, you will not remember it. You know, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, how many of you, when you went, when you went to the school, you, you didn't want to bring your notebook and even take notes? I was like that too. But that does not work. Okay? It's always important for you to take notes. Because, you know, the more you take notes, the more you write it down, the more it remains and it stays in you. The more you can remember. Because you cannot rely on your memory. Huh? That's not an excuse. His question is, what if I'm not good at taking notes? It's not an excuse. You need to learn to take notes. Okay? I cannot take that as an excuse. All right? It's just like, well, I want to eat, but what if I don't know how to cook? Okay? It's no excuse. You got to learn. Amen? Well, you know, I want to drive, but I don't want to get a license. I mean, those are, those are just excuses that... Uh, we are not going to allow in our preacher's training program. Amen? Amen? Okay, you know what? Be excited about your calling because that is a special calling. Amen. And not everybody is called to obey God and serve God. Amen. You know, what you have as a preacher and as a teacher of the gospel is a special calling from God. Amen. And you need to take that and own that calling from the Lord. You are in that kind of position. You are in that calling not because of your choice, but because, but because God has chosen you. To give you the opportunity to be blessed by God. To give you the opportunity to be used by God. In what? In also building up other people. In serving the Lord. You know, guess what? If you don't do your job, God will choose somebody else. If God will choose somebody else, God will grab your crown. Huh? God will, uh, will, will take your crown. The crown that you, that, 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 should, you, that you should be getting. Somebody else will get that crown. Okay, so you need, you need to take your responsibility and your calling seriously. Amen? Okay, am I making myself clear? All right, praise God for our new preachers. Uh, Humero, Jeremy, and also we have uh, Mill. Okay, and of course, uh, who else? And also we, we have, we have uh, Gabriel at the back. Amen. Praise God for that. And who else? Of course, our, uh, our, our junior and, uh, and senior preachers. Okay, praise God for you. I, pr I, I pray that you remain. Okay. Now, let's now begin with the, re with the reliability of the Old Testament. Now, of course, this is not, my original, uh, this is not uh, uh, originally coming from me. This is from the materials written by David Moore. Okay. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, because I, I, found, I find that David's more material is uh, really wonderful uh, in, 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 in the area of the, the reliability of the Old Testament. How many books are there in the Old Testament? Okay, there you go. Some of you don't know. Okay, all right. There are 39 books of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament and its 39 books were completed around 400 B.C. Unfortunately, none of the original writings or the original copies exist today. That's why we have a lot of uh, critics of the Old Testament who have uh, claimed that uh, today's Old Testament is seriously flawed. Not credible and not reliable. But of course, as a Bible believing Christian, we believe that the Old Testament is a reliable source of information, amen? Of divine information. Despite the fact that the Old Testament has been translated, retranslated, copied, and recopied multiple thousands of times. 
still by fallible people still by the supernatural act of God the Old Testament scriptures remain reliable amen and infallible that's something we can never understand is only by the grace of God it's only by the power of God is only by the miraculous act of God. That's why we believe the Bible by faith. Amen? Now, based on history, from 8100 to 500, this is how the Old Testament texts uh, uh, you know, were, 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 were actually uh, transferred okay, uh, to, our, to, to our times. From 8100 to 500, people called the Talmudists. T-A-L-M-U-D-I-S-T-S. -S. Talmudists. Okay. Produced copies of the Old Testament. It was a task so secret and sacred that they worked in full Jewish dress, Jewish attire. And they would wash their entire body before copying a single word. Can you imagine that? Because they considered each word and each text so sacred that they would not dare write a single letter coming from the Old Testament manuscripts by not, you know, washing their entire body and putting on the Jewish attire. That's how important the Word of God was to them. But compared to our times, we no longer... We no longer respect the word of God. Right? In fact, we now reject the word of God. We take it aside. You know, we read more the magazines and the people's magazines and Time Magazine instead of the word of God. And that's really sad. That means during this time, the Talmudists, every scroll was made of particular materials. They would not choose any material but a particular materials to write God's word. And penned in special ink. So, apparently there was a special ink that, was, that, that uh, uh, was supposed to be used in order for them to write and copy the word of God from the manuscript. That means not a single word could be written from memory. And to prevent mistakes... Every column had to contain exactly 30 letters. That's how strict they were. Every column had to contain exactly 30 letters. Now, what's unfortunate about this is the copies did not remain in our time. None of their work remains today. They were all destroyed. But again, okay... Because of God's supernatural act, despite the fact that the copies of the Talmudists were all lost, we still have the credible and the infallible Old Testament copies. Amen? Praise God. Now, following the Talmudists was a time known as the Masoretic period. I hope you're taking, you're taking some notes. Because, you know, this is now the, start, the beginning of our instructions. I might give you a test next Sunday, next uh, Wednesday. Okay, so what's the next, uh, next period? Masoretic period. All right, the first is Talmudist period. The next is the Masoretic period. Now, during this period, copyists took great care to enumerate, to count, and compare even tallying every time a letter of the alphabet occurred in each book. That's how precise they wanted to copy the word of God. They identified, now I don't know why they did these things. Okay, of course, it's not for us to question. We just need to praise God they did that. Okay, that's, that's the reason why we have a copy of God's word today. Amen? They identified the middle letter and middle word of each book. Then the Pentateuch, then the entire Old Testament. If anything, now this is very interest, interesting. If anything didn't match up perfectly, the entire manuscript was destroyed. That means after 
uh, laboring for many, many hours and copying the manuscripts. And they made one mistake. They would totally destroy everything. How, 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 would, you, how would you like do, to do that? You know, after, after uh, spending uh, one week and just destroy everything. Why, 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 why did they do this? Because they consider God's word sacred. They consider God's word so important. See? That means everything must match up. All the letters must match up. All the words must match. Until 1947, these were the best copies in existence. That means the Masoretic copies, okay, were in existence until 1947. And I, I, I could just, uh, I, I could assure you that even until today, some copies are still in existence right now. Uh, I guess what, what it meant by that is they, it's, it's, uh, it was determined that they had that copies of Masoretic, from the Masoretic period in 1947. Okay? But it's still, there was, there was still a gap of about 1,200 to 1,500 years between them and the originals. And because of these gaps, you know, uh, many people continue to question the reliability and the credibility and the infallibility of the Old Testament scriptures. Because this situation left a lot of room for questions about the accuracy of the Old Testament scriptures. However, all that changed in 1947. You know why? With the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. How many of you heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? That was a great blessing. Because when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, it uh, once and for all established the credibility of God's word. Amazingly. Okay? Now the Dead Sea Scrolls were written in approximately 150 B.C. Okay, that means uh, uh, also copied from, uh, from, from uh, the text uh, they had at the time. And so suddenly these manuscripts took us at least 1,000 years closer to the originals. So although the originals... Uh, uh, were no longer in existence, so we now become much, much closer to the originals. Critics claimed we, we would have to make serious revisions to correct scores of error in our Old Testament. That's what they claim. Okay, you know, because of, uh, because of uh, the lapse and because of, uh, of the gap from the original uh, writings of the Old Testament. But, I want you to listen to this. But the Dead Sea Scrolls actually revealed nothing less than the miraculous. When they began to compare the Dead Sea Scrolls with the copies that we have today, on average, experts found only one variation per every 1,580 words. 98% of them, close to 100%, were simple spelling variations, and none of the variances affected the meaning of the text. Isn't that incredible? Now what is the bottom line? The bottom line is, the text is reliable. Amen? The Word of God, the Old Testament text, remains the same until today. And what do you call that? Miraculous. What, what, what other name can you say? Can, can you describe? Supernatural. What others? Incredible. Okay? It's not because of human ingenuity. Okay? It's because of divine intervention. Truly the promise uh, of the Bible that says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Amen. It remains with us forever. Amen. Amen? 
you know, if the world will, uh, will all crumble and crash and uh, vanish, the world will remain forever, even in the future eternity. Amazing. Amen? Yeah. Now, archaeology affirms once again that the Old Testament is reliable. Now, for example, critics of the Bible claim for decades that the Hittites, you know the Hittites in the Old Testament? A group of people. We read that all the time in the Old Testament about the Hittites. Okay? Of the Old Testament, people claim... Historians claim that they did not really exist. That the writers had just invented them to establish a literal enemy. All that changed when 1,200 years of his Hittite, his Hittite history were discovered. You know, in some uh, archaeological findings. So therefore, they have, uh, they have found out that a Hittite, the Hittites were really a true group of people existing during the Old Testament times. See? Because for many, many years, the Hittites were only mentioned in the scriptures. Now upon excavation, after excavation, historians, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a kind of uh, discovered uh, through archaeology and through writings from archaeology that the Hittite nation truly exists. Okay, what is the conclusion then? Not only the text is reliable, but the history describes in the Old Testament is also reliable. I remember at one time they were also questioning David. King David, because it said, you know, only the, uh, the King David is only mentioned in the Bible. There's no secular history that David's uh, name was mentioned. And don't you realize, don't you realize that, uh, that uh, uh, I think within these five years, they've actually unearthed it, a credible, uh, credible f uh, 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 proof, okay, uh, from archaeology that King David was mentioned in history. That means all the things that have been uh, uh, disclosed in the scriptures are coming out. Okay? But of course, the basis of our faith is not from archaeological findings. Amen? The basis of our belief is not because it's mentioned in secular history. The basis of our faith is coming from the Word of God. Amen. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the Word of God. Yes. What? Oh, the, the, the Mount Ararat? No, ma, not Mount Arayat, huh? As in Pampanga. Okay. Mount, ma, Mount Ararat, okay. The Mount Ararat, the Lost Ark. Oh, yeah, the Lost Ark. I mean, that's, that's another, that, that's another uh, uh, I think find things that some claim to have discovered. Okay, but of course uh, uh, we're not assured yet of that. But you know what? Uh, uh, whether or not they find the, the ark, we believe it really occurred. Amen. See, because our faith is not based on the, the findings uh, 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 in history. Okay, our faith remains on the word of God. Okay. I think, I think we need to uh, uh, be persuaded about God's word. All right? Just like what I said, you know, before, before even medicine concluded that, uh, concluded that life is in the blood already, the, uh, the, the, the Bible described that life is in the blood. Uh, before Magellan circumnavigated the whole earth to prove that the earth is round, already the word of God declared that the earth is a sphere. At one time, they thought that the earth was flat. Yeah, that if you, could, if you would continue on sailing and reach the edge of the earth, you'll fall. Can you believe that? Okay? That means, that means uh, uh, all what the Bible declares, all what the Bible, uh, what the Bible has written, okay, are all true. 
Okay. Now, so while both literary discoveries and, ar and archaeology support the re reliability of the Old Testament, the most, affirm the most amazing affirmation of is its fulfilled prophecy. That's the most amazing affirmation okay, of the Old Testament uh, reliability and credibility is its fulfilled prophecy. Now, let me give you one example. <clears throat> Around 700 B.C., the prophet Isaiah predicted that one day a king named Cyrus would issue a decree to rebuild the temple. You can find it in Isaiah 44, verse 28, and Isaiah 45, verse 1. So Isaiah made a prophecy that a king named Cyrus would issue a decree to rebuild the temple. But the problem with that is this. Of course, not really a problem. Okay? But it will be a problem with those who, who are naysayers. Is this. That at the time it was prophesied, the temple was still intact. So the temple was still intact. And all of a sudden the prophet Isaiah prophesied the temple would be rebuilt. Now who would, who would dare accept that prophecy? Why would you say that it's going to be rebuilt? The temple is intact. It's here before us. Built, constructed. I, we see it. So his prediction seemed ludicru uh, you know, ludicrous at the time. S since Jerusalem was secure and the temple was intact. But about a hundred years later, in 586 BC, a Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And you can find that story in 2 Kings 25 verses 8 to 10. Then, in 539, a king named Cyrus came to power and issued the decree. You can find it in Isaiah and Ezra, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. The prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled. Isn't that incredible? Why? Because the prophecy of God's word is also remarkable. So here we have uh, concluded that uh, the text is reliable and accurate. Not only that, the history is reliable and accurate. And thirdly, the prophecy is also remarkable and accurate. That means when we read in the Old Testament scriptures... We may do so with absolute assurance that it is the unchanged, uncorrupted, inspired, authentic, infallible, and credible word of God. Amen? Okay, so that is the reliability of the old. Testament. Let's now go to the reliability of the New Testament. You know, the Old Testament uh, has also been maligned through the years and through the, through, through the centuries until today. Rejected. Okay? Counted unworthy. And people are still wondering if uh, they can really fully trust the New Testament. A collection of documents and writings written around 2,000 years ago. The historical reliability of the scripture should be tested by the same criteria by which all historical documents are tested. There was uh, one military historian by the name of C. Sanders. 
and C. Sanders, military historian, lists three basic principles of historiography. All right? Who was the person who was the military historian? C. Sanders. And he lists three basic principles of historiography. What are the three basic principles of historiography? The first one is bibliographical test. Bibliographical test. Number two, internal evidence test. Number three, external evidence test. Okay, what are the three tests? Bibliographical test. The second, internal evidence test. And then the external evidence test. You're not taking, you're not taking notes, Jeremy. You can remember these things? Huh? No, I don't believe you. The Bible is reliable, but not your mind. Okay. Historio. Historio. H-I-S-T-O-R-I-O. G-R-A-P-H-Y. Historiography. Historiography. Now, let's, let's consider the first one. The bibliographical test. The bibliographical test is an examination of the textual transmission by which documents reach us. Okay? It is an examination of the textual transmission by which doc documents reach us. How reliable are the extant copies of the original manuscripts? We can answer this question by examining the time interval between the original and extant copy. Over 20,000 copies of New Testament manuscripts are in existence today. How many? 20,000 copies of the New Testament manuscripts are in existence today. With the, with the earliest copy dating 1 to 130 AD. What is the earliest copy? Dating to what? 130 AD. Less than 100 years after it was originally penned. That means the New Testament has more manuscript authority than any piece of literature from antiquity. That is wonderful. Can you imagine 20,000 copies? I mean, can you ever find any antiquated books with 20,000 copies today? No. But the New Testament has that. Now, who would think that, uh, uh, that, the, the, the Old Test that the New Testament scripture is worth uh, uh, pre preserving throughout these years? If the, if the Old Testament scriptures were not really the word of God. So the, the bibliographical test has determined that the words of the earliest manuscripts we have available are exactly what were originally recorded. And of course, you know, they were able to compare what we have today. Okay, but the question again is this. Are the original manuscripts credible? Again, the author's credibility is also determined by the internal evidence test. Okay, so now let's go to the next test. The internal evidence test. Now, Dr. Lewis Gottschalk. L-O-U-I-S. G-O-T-T-S-C-H-A-L-K. Former professor of history at the University of Chicago points out that the ability of the writer or the witness to tell the truth is helpful to the historian to determine credibility. And that's true. 
This ability to tell the truth is closely related to the witness's nearness both geographically and chronologically to the events recorded. Now, the New Testament accounts of the life and teachings of Jesus were recorded by men who had been either eyewitnesses or those who related the accounts of eyewitnesses of the actual events and teachings of Christ. That means these were eyewitnesses present during the time of Christ, during the life of Christ, during the New Testament times. And this closeness to the recorded accounts is an extremely effective means of certifying the accuracy of what is retained by a witness. The, the historian, however, also has to deal with an eyewitness who either consciously or unconsciously tells falsehoods, even though he is near to the event and is competent to tell the truth. The New Testament accounts of Christ were being circulated within the lifetime of those alive at the time of Christ. These people could certainly confirm or deny the accuracy of the accounts. You know, because according to even the, uh, his history, we could actually read a lot of uh, credible witnesses who could testify about the reality of the Old Testament, of the New Testament scriptures. And these were people who were not even uh, writers of the New Testament. These were people who were not even mentioned in the New Testament, but they gave a credible witness to the New Testament accounts. Why? Because they were eyewitnesses during the time of Christ. There were eyewitnesses in the miraculous uh, uh, activity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's now go to the third test of historicity. And that is the external evidence test. The external evidence test. Gottschalk, Dr. Gottschalk argues that conformity or agreement with other known historical or scientific facts is often the decisive test of evidence whether of one or of more witnesses. Now, for instance, there was a friend of the Apostle John who confirmed the internal evidence from John's account. His name is Polycarp. It's not the fish, okay? It's one of the uh, fathers of the church, Polycarp. Bishop of Smyrna, AD 70 to AD 160. Polycarp was a disciple of John, the beloved, who testified that John penned the Gospel of John while in Ephesus. Now, this person was not even, you know, a, a writer of the, Old Test of the New Testament. So Polycarp's testimony regarding John is recorded in the, thresh, in the tre treatise entitled Against Heresies, written by Irenaeus, the Bishop of Lyon, 8140-200. Therefore, if a person discards the scripture as in unreliable, then he or she must discard almost all the literature of antiquity. The New Testament is indeed trustworthy and historically reliable in its witness about Jesus. I believe I showed a uh, documentary here about the reliability of, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ because of the witnesses, uh, eyewitnesses uh, to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the miraculous work. I'm going to show that again during, uh, during this time on the one's day. I found that in the Netflix you know, and I think it's good. How many of you have seen that when you were here? I think I showed it to some of you here, right? Yeah, I showed it to some of you. I'm going to show it again because that's, a, that's, that's an incredible, that's an incredible, uh, you know, tool. In, because in that particular documentary, it points out uh, how true the New Testament uh, scripture is. Okay? Compared to the history we have today. Now, that only means that the Bible that we have today 
is the infallible word of God. That the Bible I'm holding in my hand today, okay, is the inspired word of God. By the way, the inspiration is not only assigned to the original manuscripts. I believe the copies I have today is also the inspired word of God. Now we need to be careful in say, stating that because so many religions and so many theologians only believe that the only inspired were the originals. And they would tell you at the top of their voice that we do not have the inspired word of God today. Because only the original writings were inspired. But let me tell you, the inspiration of the word of God has been preserved because of the power of God. The supernatural power of God. That means the Bible I'm, I'm holding, you, I'm holding uh, you know, today is totally the word of God. And we need to be persuaded of this. Amen? Because if you're not persuaded, then, it, then you don't have any business teaching and preaching God's word. If you're not totally convinced that the word of God is true and credible and reliable, you ought not to preach and teach about the word of God. Amen? Okay, so I trust that this uh, initial lesson will really help you uh, be totally persuaded about God's word. Amen? Amen. Okay. Are you not ready for the test next week? Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to have a test next week. Open notes? No, open eyes. But no notes. Okay. No sharing of notes. <laughs> okay, let's all stand, please, and let us pray. Our Father in heaven, oh God, again, thank you, O Lord, that uh, you have given us, O Lord, the word of God. The source of our faith. The source of our hope. The source of our doctrines and practice. I pray, O oh God, that you give us the uh, renewed uh, yearning and desire, O oh God, to know your word. And to be instructed by your word. I pray, O oh God, for IABC members and even for the preachers who have called to preach and teach, O oh Lord. That they will totally, O oh God, uh, submerge themselves, immerse themselves, O oh God, with the word. And give them, O oh Lord, the new desire, O oh God, of uh, really reading God's word for their edification maturity, and declaration of truth to others. I pray, O oh God, for our preachers and our teachers, O oh Lord. I pray, O oh God, for all the members of IABC. And again, thank you, O oh Lord, for choosing us to be stewards, O oh God, of this wonderful book. I pray, O oh God, that uh, we will really manifest, O oh Lord, your word in our lives. That the word that we claim to believe in, O oh God, is not only uh, something that we broadcast in words, but it is something, O oh God, that we also manifest through our lives, through the way we live, through the way we behave. Again, we give you all the praises and all the glory in Christ's name as all these things. Amen. Remain standing as we now uh, sing our last song. Would you please, uh, you have an announcement? Okay, go ahead. Um, oh, please sit down for a while. Just uh, like to make a quick announcement. Um, just, uh, just to jumpstart the uh, promotion of our couples ministry. Uh, just like to uh, ask a few questions. How many are couples here? Uh, raise your hands. Amen. We've got quite a few. How many are married? Amen.